Hi, I'm Margaret Martin at Melio Guide. I'm a registered physiotherapist. Melio Guide is all about aging well with exercise with a special focus on osteoporosis. Today, my special guest is Dr. Janet Rubin. She's a distinguished professor of medicine in the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism at the University of North Carolina. She's also vice chair of research in the Department of Medicine. On top of all these things, she maintains a clinical practice helping people with their osteoporosis. Dr. Rubin has been investigating bone remodeling for decades. Her particular focus has been on how exercise and mechanical forces affect cell cytoskeleton and how that stimulation alters the stem cell lineage, what they become. So Dr. Janet Rubin, has not only accomplished all of these things, but she's also been voted by her peers onto the list of best doctors in America, a recognition that she's held since 2008. In today's discussion, Dr. Rubin discusses bone remodeling so that you as listeners can better understand the role of exercise and nutrition in the remodeling of our bones, especially in regards to osteoporosis. So your area of research for the past 30 years has been in the area of bone remodeling. Would you mind explaining bone remodeling? Sure. I guess the, the simplest way to think of it is when you're growing, you have to make bone and you also have to model it. So the way that your, your bones have to change as you grow. So during growth, you have osteoblasts that make bone, lay down bone and form it. And you have osteoclasts, these cells that come from a completely different lineage, the hematopoietic or bone or blood lineage, and they break bone down. So they work in concert. Once you attain full skeletal maturity, which is probably around 16 to 18 for women and a little later for, for men, um, then you are remodeling. So you don't make new bone, you're constantly remodeling. And whether you have any events to your bone, you're still going to remodel. So if you all of a sudden decide that you're gonna lift huge amounts of weight, then you're gonna remodel your bones to deal with that increased weight if you go up into space, you're gonna, your skeleton is gonna say, I don't need all this bone because you're floating around. So the osteoclast will do more work. So, and then if you fracture, you're gonna have to remodel the fracture uh, to heal the, the bone. So the osteoblasts make the bone and the osteoclast remodel or take away the bone so that it can be uh, fit and adapted. Um, that's the bottom line for, for bone remodeling and the drugs that we use in osteoporosis uh, therapy are aimed at osteoclasts or osteoblasts. So you've answered a little bit of, of where I was going to go to next, which is great in that as we exercise, you know, the bone gets that stimulus and if we go to outer space or stop exercising or moving, or if some other health condition brings us to a state of not being able to move as much, we will start to, to stimulate less osteoblasts and the osteoclasts are still active. Now there seems to be sort of um, an imbalance that happens in life. And so would you mind talking about um, the impact of nutrition and pharmaceuticals on bone remodeling. So if, if I could, let me just, I think you you led into when, when you're really gonna see major changes after you finish growing. One would be if you went to bed. So if you went to bed or you sat in a chair and you never got up or you went into space, you start remodeling because the because as I said, the bone to anthropomorphize says, I need to, I don't need to be so strong. The second place where women really, everybody, you know, starts losing bone, whether they're men or women when they get very old. 
But women, when they stop having estrogen around in the postmenopausal period, that's when osteoclasts work much harder. And so there is, there is remodeling that goes on at that time. Now, in t terms of nutrition, I don't think that much about nutrition as an endocrinologist until I'm really looking at older people or people are trying to exercise and I'm like, you need to eat more protein. So in general, if you're starving, you're going to lose muscle and bone. So a, a good example of, of changes in nutrition would be somebody who is obese enough to get a gastric bypass, which is a one way of treating that. And as they lose weight, if they aren't exercising, if they aren't telling their bones, I need you here, as they lose fat, they will also lose muscle and they will also lose bone. And that's very, very clear. That also happens if you're really ill in the hospital and you're lying down. Not only do you have this loss of loading the bone, but you also have nutritional issues. They're a little harder to tie to bone loss, but bone is you know, it's something that you think about anabolism or building and catabolism losing. So if you're losing muscle for whatever reason, you're certainly losing bone as well. You brought in the, that you don't think too much about the nutritional part when with remodeling, um, except when people are losing weight rapidly and then they're losing muscle and bone. So if we can finish up that one, only because I get contacted by a lot of people that you know, when they got the, get the diagnosis of osteoporosis, they are sending me lists of supplements that they're on. Oh, the, the supplements. The, the supplements. <laughs> supplements drive doctors crazy because we don't know what they are. People who like supplements are usually on 10 to 40 of them. I don't have time to look at them. They change. They're not FDA regulated in the United States. So we have no idea. We tend to distrust them. They cost a lot of money. The patients don't want to pay for their medical care, but they'll put thousands of dollars into supplements. So it makes me crazy. I don't, I, I try to be my patient's partner rather than their adversary. So I will say to them, if you really love these supplements, it's okay, but I'm not sure that you need them. Um, so some supplements are a problem. I, I, you know, I can tell you that supplements that say there are no animal products in there, right? So, so there was a beautiful paper in thyroid probably about 10 years ago where the, the group went to a, you know, a, a nutrition center and bought a bunch of, these will boost your thyroid, right? No animal products, right? In them. And of seven of them, I think five of them have thyroid hormone in them, which you can only get from an animal. So you need to, nobody, you know, what, what people want us to do and you to do is say, it's okay, this supplement is okay. Well, we don't know what's in that supplement. So not a big fan, but I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna criticize you if you're taking a supplement. I'm just not gonna prescribe it to you. So yes, yeah, so on that vein, I did have an opportunity um, two years ago, so to talk to Dr. Todd Cooperman, who owns Consumer Labs, and he tests supplements. And and sure enough, you know, a lot of them aren't either pure or they're they don't have what they say they have, or you know. Um, so, but having said that, um, when you're looking, because your whole area is bone remodeling, and we can't build bone without having an optimum. Um, you know, balance in our bone remodeling. So in your experience, the, you know, vitamin D and calcium, like the top two that we always talk about with osteoporosis, do they make any difference when it comes to remodeling? So, so both of them are part of remodeling. You have to have calcium to make bone and you have to have vitamin D for lots of a little more um, nuanced reasons. I mean, you can't absorb uh, calcium in the gut without vitamin D. What, what my long time in the bone world has taught me, I'm, 
I have all my patients on vitamin D and I prefer D3 for various reasons. But I say, you know, 800 to 1,000 of vitamin D, I don't care when you take it. You can take it once a week, once a month, whatever we, you know, that is discussed. But I don't think it hurts. The very high, some, you know, some people will come in on four or 5,000. I'm usually going to check that. Um, if you're very obese, uh, it's very, we, we don't really understand where vitamin D is. So to have a normal vitamin D level, if you're very obese, you usually have to take much higher levels. And I'm not going to say that the field really understands that, you know, where the vitamin D is. For calcium, I don't think the data is that great for calcium. Maybe when you're modeling your bones as an adolescent, it might be more important, especially if you're drinking Coke all the time instead of drinking milk. But in my ladies, I a lot of them love to take calcium. I don't mind if they take 600, maybe even if they're a, you know one of these ovo-lacto vegetarians, then I have to worry about it more. But most people don't really need a lot more calcium. And I'm very concerned about the upper limits, people taking exogenously more than 1,500 um, micro, um, milligrams or 1.5 grams because that has been associated in two meta-analyses with increased cardiovascular events. So I just keep it on the down low. I don't tell them not to take it because you know there's just controversy and I don't want to seem controversial to my patients. You wanna take 600 of calcium, be my guest. There's just not great data for calcium supporting, you know, maintaining bone mineral density, whereas there are really some pretty good studies that shows that show that if your vitamin D levels are, I usually say above 30, that you're going to lessen the decline of, of bone. So calcium and vitamin, if patients ask me about magnesium, I, you know, I'm just not a magnesium prescriber, so I don't do it. Um, so yeah, 